Hey, it's Emma here from Elevation. Um, I'm so excited for our webinar today. I just want to let you guys know that you have about five more minutes. Um, all the people that are on early will get started probably about a minute after, um, just to give everyone enough time to, enough time to get on today. Um, so you still have time to go grab a coffee or use the bathroom or grab your lunch. Um, we'll get started about 12.01. Looking forward to it. Hi everyone, Emma here from Elevation again. I just wanna let everyone know we're gonna get started about a minute or two after the hour just to give people enough time to join us. Um, so don't worry, we're gonna get started soon.
All right. Hi, everyone. Emma here from Elevation again. I'm so excited to welcome everyone to today's webinar um, hosted by us at Elevation, and we're featuring Julia Campbell. Um, I am super, super excited about this webinar. I've been looking forward, it, um, forward to it for a while now. Um, so I'm going to give it over to Julia in just one second. Um, but just a couple of housekeeping things first. Um, we will be having a live question and answer at the end. So you have a question and answer option um, in your little panel. Um, so make sure that you get those questions out there. We'll have a keep about 10 minutes aside um, at the end so we can get all those questions answered. Um, in addition, I will be sending out uh, a link to the copy of the webinar. Um, so if you miss something, don't worry about it. Um, you will be able to, you'll be able to be able to catch up and take notes and all that, um, as well as I will be putting it on our new webinars page and I will send out a link to that as well. Um, so I really wanna welcome Julia Campbell. She's a nonprofit social media expert um, and I'm not even gonna say anything else because I'm so excited to hear what she has to say. So thanks so much for joining us, Julia. Thank you, thanks Emma. I'm so excited to be here today um, and Everyone can see my slides, everyone can hear me. I'm sure that there won't be any tech problems and now I just jinxed it, but all right, we're gonna get started. Today we're gonna talk about how to drive engagement with your social media, on your social media with your nonprofit stories. A little bit about me if you don't know who I am already. I am a mom of two. I'm a return Peace Corps volunteer and Emma and I were just talking about this. She lived in Ghana for a little while. I lived in Senegal. And usually when I talk to nonprofits, I do have some RPCVs um, on the webinars because we are a very socially conscious group. We tend to gravitate toward nonprofit work, it seems like. I've also been a former development and marketing director. I've worked with very small shops. I understand your pain. I know what you're going through. I know what it's like to bootstrap and DIY your way through new social media platforms and CRMs and websites and emails. So I understand where you're coming from. And that's really how I design my trainings with you in mind, the small shop or the bootstrapping nonprofit. I wrote a book about storytelling and how to use the power of your stories in the digital age, how to mold them into the proper channels. That's a lot about what we're going to talk about today. And I'm very passionate about digital, digital storytelling. If you do want to tweet during the webinar, I would love if you did that. You can see at the bottom, it's pretty small, but um, I'm at Julia C. Social and make sure you tag elevation underscore web if you tweet and I will respond to every tweet if you see anything that you, that you like. Um, so what are we gonna cover today? We're going to go over some specific actionable strategies that you can use uh, to connect with your supporters. I always use a lot of real world examples. You should see my phone and my desktop. It's basically littered with screenshots from nonprofits doing great things, nonprofits of all sizes. So I really like to use real world tangible examples, a lot from small organizations that you can then use for ideas, inspiration, adapt and emulate. At the end, we're gonna talk about some tools that you can use, some free and low cost tools that you can use to rock your digital storytelling on a shoestring. All right, so why do we tell stories? We tell stories because people are not rational beings. We want them to be rational beings. We understand why we do the work that we do. We know that it's important. We know that we're changing lives, we're saving lives, we are saving the environment, we're preserving history, we're preserving culture, we're saving children, whatever it is that we're doing. How can we truly express the importance of our work? The thing is you have to make people feel something. You can tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them something until you're blue in the face, give them data, give them statistics, give them information. But until you make them feel something, you are not going to get them to actually take an action. So remember what Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, people will never forget how you made them feel. In addition, donors have told us they want stories. So this is going to be your content plan 
for 2019, 60% of what you post and share and create should be impact and success stories. So this is a study that was done by BlackBot. It's up on the Classy blog. And this is these are from the words of supporters. These are actual donors and supporters that were surveyed. And they were asked, what kind of communications do you want to receive from the nonprofits that you support? And they said impact and success stories. I would even go higher than 60%, but of course we have so many other things that we want to tell people. So not only are stories the most effective way to communicate our ideas, they are the actual form of communication the supporters want to hear. Mark Phillips came up with this amazing Venn diagram. You can read about it at um, the blog Queer Ideas and I like to encourage you to look at this, but also print it out and put it above your desk, especially if you're a development director, because we get so focused on the blue part, things that we want to tell a donor, our agenda. I get this question all the time. How can I push out my message? How can I get my message in front of more people? The mindset of pushing out messages, we need to reframe it into encouraging and deepening relationships with our donors. And that's on the purple side. We need to tell donors that their donations are appreciated, that they're meaningful, and the best way to do that is with stories. I wanna talk a little bit about the social media landscape because this is a question that I get a lot. And I just wanna show you some of the things that go on in the social media landscape and the online landscape. So we know that the internet is an incre incredibly, I was gonna say increasingly and incredibly at the same time, increasingly cluttered and noisy place. So this is just a little bit of a snapshot of what happens in an internet minute. So in I show this to you, not to overwhelm you, not so you can just you know throw up your hands and say, oh, well, I'll never be able to cut through that clutter. Just to say that you will never beat the internet on volume, you're not gonna, beat the internet on the number of posts and tweets and videos and things that you share, but you can beat the internet on quality. So you're never going to beat the internet on quantity. You can beat the internet on quality because a lot of this stuff that's being shared is really not high quality, not to mention it's really not targeted at your audience. And we're going to talk about how to target your specific audience. So despite the, despite the delete Facebook movement, and all of the incredibly horrific headlines that I've been reading, I actually saved them all and I'm gonna compile them somehow into a blog post, all the negative press that social media has been getting, and rightfully so, there's a lot of terrible stuff that happens. Social media use is growing and it's growing among all demographics, amongst all age groups. So the popularity of various sites goes up and down. And of course, the adoption of various sites by different age groups goes up and down. But young people are still using social media. And I call young people 18 to 24. That's not even millennials anymore. That's Gen Z, I believe. And actually, YouTube is the most popular social media site amongst young people. And Facebook is second. So see that young people are still on Facebook. I don't know how often they use it. I don't know if they just use it so that they can tell their mom they're on it. I don't know but they are still using it. So I really encourage you to go to Pew Internet, that's P-E-W, Internet, and take a look at the demographic reports. These are useful for those social media skeptics in your organization or just for your own edification and your own education around the trends in social media use. The majority of people are using these platforms on a daily basis. Social media use is growing. It's not growing like it was doing in you know 2004, but it's growing. It's not really going down. Nonprofits, in addition, are increasing their social media audiences with Instagram being the one that's just exploding. Um, a fantastic free resource for you is the MNR Benchmarks Report. That's at mrbenchmarks.com. They release it every year and that will really help you benchmark where your organization is and they release a lot of it by vertical, by different nonprofit type, by different nonprofit size. So, you know, I would really, really recommend checking out the MR Benchmarks Report to learn more about where your nonprofit fits in.
And of course, the biggest trend in social media for nonprofits, Facebook birthday fundraisers. I'm happy to talk about that at the end in questions. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit today, but we're not really gonna get into the weeds of the pros and cons and the good, the bad, the ugly of Facebook fundraising. All I will say to you is that it is a complete revolution, especially in online fundraising. And it's going to, if it hasn't already, completely revolutionize the way that nonprofits are using social media. So we now see the introduction on YouTube of YouTube giving tools that look a lot like the Facebook tools because of course Google and YouTube don't wanna be left behind. Um, Potentially, we could see this on Twitter. Instagram, of course, is owned by Facebook. They don't have a donate button yet, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that's coming. So there, there has been a complete revolution in the last year, a complete change in how nonprofits are using social media. They are using them to physically raise money. Um, so today we're gonna talk about how to drive engagement. So engagement can mean several different things. I really think engagement means building a community, getting people excited and looking forward to the kind of content that you're sharing. Whether it's drawing them in, bringing them into the fold, bringing them in a little bit deeper, having them make a deeper connection so that when you do hold that Facebook fundraiser, when you do ask for money on YouTube or Twitter or any of those other social media sites, they are more receptive. You know, you've kind of primed the pump for them. So the very, very first step in this process is to define success. So this is not the most fun, this is not the most fun step. And this is the first step that I talk about with my clients. And they, of course, want to jump right into Facebook fundraisers and launch an Instagram campaign and sign up for text to give tools and all of those things. But I say, okay, the tools are worth nothing if you don't know where you're going, that's sort of like telling me, hey, I want to go somewhere. Should I take a train or a bus or an airplane? Okay, I really don't know because I don't know where you're going. Where are you going? What do you hope to accomplish? One year from now, how will you know you've succeeded? You have to spend some time defining success for your organization, defining success for your digital marketing, for your social media storytelling efforts, because if you don't have that end result, then you are certainly not gonna know the strategies and tools to use to get there. The second most important piece of this journey is understanding your audience. Your audience, everyone on this webinar has a different audience. Of course, there might be some overlap, but a domestic violence shelter is going to have an audience that's interested in different things than the local um, pit bull rescue. So know your audience. What do your supporters really and truly value? What do they want to know more about as related to your nonprofit and your work. Where are the knowledge gaps? Where are the myths and misconceptions? Where are the stereotypes? What are they interested in? What do they value? And what are some common themes and common threads that tie everyone that's involved with your organization together? What are those common themes? A quote that I love to use, people like us do things like this. So Seth Godin is my go-to marketing guru. I mean, he's just amazing. He just released another book called This Is Marketing, and I'm already like halfway through it. He says, and I believe him, we need to cultivate through our stories a sense of community so that when I look at your organization, I feel like I'm a part of something that's a little bit exclusive. So I say, okay, yeah, people like us do things like this. I support the local food bank. You know, I, get, I do a turkey drive at the school every year. I collect food. I collect items for the homeless shelter. That's what I'm passionate about. That's what I like. People like me, we do things like this. So through our stories, we're going to create that sense of community and that sense of exclusivity almost, that sense of building a group of people that have shared ethics, shared values, shared passions, you know, shared missions, shared goals. So when you're creating your social media content, this is incredibly 
important. Social media is a value exchange. I give you my time and my attention and you give me something that's worth my time and attention. So that is why many, many nonprofits and brands and people and a lot of just regular old folks on social media don't get as much engagement as they think they deserve because they don't understand that social media is a value exchange. You have to answer this question, what's in it for me? That's what someone is saying when they're on their Twitter feed, they're on Instagram, they're on Facebook, what's in it for me? What value are you providing? And then how can you educate me? Maybe the value you provide is inspiration. Maybe the value you provide is hope. Maybe the value you provide is that community, that sense and feeling of community that I was talking about. Also thinking strategically about knowledge gaps. So there's a lot of planning that goes into a successful social media storytelling strategy. It's really not just winging it and it really the organizations that do it well, they're not just lucky. They spend a lot of time and effort planning out their strategies. So think about the kinds of things your target audience already knows about you. What do they know about you? And then what misconceptions might they have? Even the people that know and love you, what are some popular misconceptions, some popular myths, some popular stereotypes? And how can your social media content and the stories that you share help to fill in these knowledge gaps? So at their F8 developer conference this year, Facebook told us what it takes to succeed. They actually gave us the strategy. They might not have told us specifically how to do it, but they did tell us what it takes to succeed. So their head of newsfeed went on, you know, he was at the conference and he said that in 2018 going to 2019, the type of content that's going to be promoted by Facebook is trusted, informative, local, and content that inspires meaningful interactions and inspires conversation. I actually feel strongly that this puts nonprofits at an advantage and not a disadvantage because think about what our purpose is, what our missions are, and think about the kind of emotion, the kind of feeling that we want to inspire in our donors. We want them to trust us. We want them to feel like we are being informative. Um, most of us probably have a local focus and we do want to inspire conversations. So I think that this is a boon to social causes and you know social um, socially conscious organizations everywhere. So the first type of content, content that builds trust. For nonprofits, there's nothing that builds trust more than showcasing impact. And the best way to showcase your impact is through storytelling. Putting stories on your website that you can then pull from, that you can then highlight Back on My Feet combats homelessness through the power of running, community support, and essential employment and housing resources. Okay, great. That's a wonderful mission statement. I don't really know what that means. I mean, I can kind of see what that means. And of course, we all have mission statements like this. But then showing me the actual stories, the impact, that mission in action. The Cabrera School for Girls, they always tell fantastic stories in the girls' own words. So they do a lot of pull quotes. They do a lot of interviews. They do a lot of Q&A with the, the beneficiaries of the schools, the students at the schools. Best Buddies International, they also do a lot of pull quotes. The stories that they share on social media tend to come from their networks. They come from their mentors and they come from their mentees. So they're monitoring the different chapters, they're monitoring their partners, they are listening for the kinds of stories being shared by the people participating in their program. And a lot of the time with Best Buddies, they let the picture speak for themselves. So you don't have to have this beginning, middle and end kind of story, especially when you're talking about, uh, when you're talking about social media. So when you're talking about a gala or you're creating a 20 minute video for a capital campaign, that's a little bit different. But for social media, you can have these bite-sized snackable stories, these kind of snippets 
and the picture and the visual help tell the story along with the caption. The Greater Boston Food Bank is one of my favorite organizations and they are where I live in Greater Boston. They um, have incredible series of videos on their website. The key to posting a great video is clearly to tell a story, but then to put a little bit of a hook on it so people will actually click on it. You know, it's not so much how you fall, it's how you get back up. So what's going to entice me to want to read more of this story? What's going to entice me to want to watch this video? Don't tell me the whole story in the caption. Just give me a little bit, share with me a little bit of the story, and then let the video speak for itself. Another way to build trust is to share these kinds of stories about either your president, your CEO, your executive director, your board chair, maybe a staff member that was interviewed. These stories are okay to share. You don't want to constantly be patting yourself on the back and sharing self-promotional information. But this kind of story really does have that benefit of of building trust and increasing affinity for the organization. And also it's um, filling a knowledge gap, you know, understand why even people who are working find it hard to put food on the table. That's a real misconception about the working poor, about people that use food pantries is that they're completely destitute or they're hungry, but oftentimes they're working really, really hard. So think about that, how can your stories address those, those knowledge gaps? Okay, the number two type of content, content that informs. So these are helpful resources targeted to your audience. Remember, I'm going to drill this into you. Social media is a value exchange. It is a value exchange. California hospital volunteers, they know their audience. Their audience are volunteers, specifically people that volunteer their time at hospitals. But like everything else, if you volunteer one place, you're probably more likely to volunteer in another place. So they share a lot of information about the tangible benefits of volunteering. United Way of Massachusetts Bay, I love this. I think this is, this is great on so many levels. One, I love the visual. Two, it's a sponsored post, so this means it's a Facebook ad. It's helping them build their email list. Because if you click on this list, you can get there six easy ways and ideas to get your family giving back this Thanksgiving. So they understand their audience because if you are interested in the United Way, if you like the United Way, uh, I'm willing to bet you're interested in your community, you're interested in giving back, and you know they targeted it at um, moms in the area and they targeted at parents. So I really like this, but offering some kind of value to your readers, even if it's just a did you know, even if it's just a nice looking graphic. So this is how Edutopia uses Instagram. Edutopia does not, is not a direct benefit organization. They don't directly benefit clients. They don't directly work with clients. So they thought they couldn't be on Instagram, but then they started sharing quotes, they started asking questions, they started doing quizzes, and they increased their Instagram engagement by a lot because they were providing some value there. All right, the third type of content, content that is local. So if you have a brick and mortar, um, like a food bank or a library or a museum or something like that, you if you have a place where you can check in, encourage check-ins, encourage location tagging. If you don't, whenever you have an event or whenever you're out somewhere at a meeting or a conference, make sure that you are checking in and tagging because Facebook loves this. Facebook wants to promote, they want to promote organizations that are local to me, to me. So if they know more about your organization and where you are, and then they know more about me and where I am, then they can match us and match our interests together. So I also think this is a really great way for organizations to get in front of new people, especially in their locality, that might be interested in working with them. Making sure that you are thanking people, tagging your partners, especially if they're local, so I love this, Meals on Wheels, you know, a dedicated, a dedicated group comes from Noble to make food pantry boxes. So it's highlighting volunteers, it's highlighting that people in the community 
are giving back. It's also tagging a local business. It's kind of tying it all together. So if I live in this community and I like Noble or I like Meals on Wheels, I'm much more likely to see this post. If you're asking for volunteers, if you're asking for local people to participate, then highlighting where you are, highlighting how they can help, um, and you know, creating a really, really distinct call to action helps really, really well. But I do think that the focus on getting us to connect with organizations and causes and issues that are local to us, nonprofits are going to start seeing the benefits of that in their newsfeed. Okay, number four, this is the most important, and this is across all social media, content that inspires conversation. Okay, so let's start inspiring conversation. Now, you know if you're on Instagram, you normally see pictures of supermodels or celebrities, or maybe that's just my Instagram, and everything is perfect and everyone looks great, and everything's filtered and everything's set up perfectly. And what the Be Real campaign wanted to do, it's out of the UK, is they wanted to turn that Instagram aesthetic on its head and showcase real people in real situations with real stories. And that really inspires conversation. Asking questions also. Are you a caretaker? Helping people make connections across social media. Helping people find what they're looking for, find community that works really well. Um, celebrating milestones, encouraging people to celebrate milestones with you. Uh, Myra New England does this all the time. They do Milestone Monday and they talk about a recent milestone that a client has reached. They don't use her name, they don't use her photo, they use a lot of stock photography, but they're bringing you in and they are asking you to help congratulate her. So you are like a part of a community. You're a part of a group of people that shares the same values and ethics, and that's really what social media is designed for, and that's one of its absolute strengths. If you're going to do a campaign where you're asking for stories, I know a lot of us do storytelling campaigns. We're really desperately trying to inspire conversation and meaningful conversation with our storytelling campaigns. You need to go first. So you're going to have to have a team member just like Victoria with her, that's my dad moment. Um, you'll probably have to go first. You or a staff member will have to go first. Share your story. Tell people what to do. Share an example of what you're looking for, what you want people to post, how you want people to participate. And they're much more likely to participate. Okay, so now we're going to go through four types of stories to share on social media. Um, there's a million kinds of stories that you can share, but these are the four types of stories that I have found get the most engagement, get the most shares, and really help build your audience and inspire those meaningful communications. So we'll talk about these four stories, and then we're going to go through some um, battle-tested digital storytelling tools. And yeah, so we've still got a lot to cover. The number one kind of story that you can share, of course, a story of your impact. So that can be as dramatic as a life changed or a trajectory altered. It is not driven by data. It's focused on benefits and not features. So the benefits of what you do and not the what you do. So yes, a woman came to your shelter and she came to your food pantry and she went through your program, but then how did that make her feel? Did that give her the confidence then to apply to community college? Did it, did it give her the confidence to go out and get that dream job she always wanted? What are the benefits of the services and the programs that you provide? And the benefits, I'm not necessarily talking like an output, I'm talking an emotional benefit. Maybe just a confidence boost or maybe just making someone happy could be a benefit. So think about the benefits the services that you provide. Don't think about what people went through when you're telling a story. Like this person did X, Y, Z, came through this, this happened to them, and then they did this, and then they came to us, and then they did this. I don't want it to be like a laundry list of tasks, a laundry list of things that they did. I want to know more about 
how your organization made them feel. I want to know about feelings and I want to know about emotion. I want that emotional impact. And it really does not have to be the hero's journey that we hear so much about, which is, of course, Luke Skywalker and Harry Potter and Wonder Woman, where there's this grand journey and at the end, lives are changed and the world is changed and everything's wrapped up in a bow. That's what I, I get very concerned that a lot of organizations think that they can't do storytelling because they don't have those kinds of stories. Honestly, it could be a woman, I came to your health center, someone was kind to me and that made me feel great. Honestly, that's really, a, that tells a story. Stories are pieces of the puzzle of your organization. You're never going to find one story to rule them all, right? Like Lord of the Rings. Like you're not going to find that one story that encompasses everything. All of these stories together are pieces of the puzzle. So storytelling with video, storytelling, you know, did you know, or storytelling around issues that everyone is very familiar with. You know, like every other senior in high school, Walter faced the same question, what do I do next? So I don't have teenagers, but I do have friends that have teenagers, and I know that that is a huge question, so anyone can really relate to that. And then talking about how Walter dealt with that question. Rosie's Place, this is an organization in Boston. I do like to showcase local organizations. They do a fantastic job storytelling. They have one development marketing person. She does all of their social media. She takes one story. So this is a video that they have on YouTube. She takes screenshots of the video and takes, um, she writes a little hook that makes you want to watch the video and then repurposes this one great story across social media, sends an email out about it. She repurposes this great story multiple times across multiple channels and gets a lot of traction out of this one great story. Stories that catch your attention, but also make you think. So I know where I am, WBUR is the NPR affiliate, and they do a fantastic job um, showcasing different stories of nonprofits, but really drawing you in with a hook. So, you know, if you read a story about a Muslim family fighting bullying, you might say, okay, I, you know, I've read that story before. Unfortunately, it's more and more common. But if you read this hook, if you see this picture, it kind of all comes together for you and you're much more likely to read or see that story. Also, did you know stories that once again, fill our knowledge gaps question our assumptions, tell us something that we don't know. Stories can be as simple as a mission moment. Like the impact of Boys and Girls Club are two girls making friends, having a safe place to go after school, playing Uno. They don't have their names, they don't tell their story, but this picture, this mission moment is a piece of the bigger story. The second kind of stories that you should be collecting and telling, insider stories, who volunteers for you? Why do they do it? This is also for staff members who works with your organization. What have they learned along the way? What is one thing they've learned along the way? What has been one of their best experiences? What's their best memory? And then what has been the hardest? Maybe what's been the most challenging? This will give people behind the scenes insight that they crave. People crave accessibility. They crave transparency. They crave that human connection behind the brand. So think about the insider stories that you can tell. Showcase your amazing volunteers, not just during National Volunteer Week. Showcase your volunteers. Why do they volunteer? And, you know, get even beyond why do you volunteer? What's has been one benefit in your life about volunteering? What is your favorite memory? What's been the most challenging? Get a little bit uh, creative in your story collection. Showcase your interns. I'm sure you guys all do a ton of tabling events. Rather than just simply you know, taking a photo, talk to the people behind the table. What's your favorite tabling event? What's the most interesting thing that's happened at a tabling event? Um, 
go behind the scenes, get interesting, think like a reporter, think like a journalist to get these stories. Stories of overcoming hardship, especially if it's someone that works for you, your COO, your housing director, showcasing the hard work, the dedication, the backstories of your employees. The third kind of story that you should be telling, your donor stories. Not only is this a powerful form of social capital because other people will see it, it will bring these donors deeper into the fold because they'll feel acknowledged and they'll feel heard. Think about why did they give? Why did they continue to give? What does it mean to them? Um, I am sure that you have these kinds of incredible stories in your repertoire. Think about people that fundraise for you, the people that have the lemonade stands. Um, maybe not, you don't have people that actually shave their head for you like St. Baldrick's, but I'm sure you have people raising money for you, running marathons for you, organizing walks, that kind of thing. Highlight those people, talk about their story, showcase their story, find out what makes them tick. What if we highlighted our corporate sponsors like the Pine Street Inn does here on Instagram? So rather than putting up a logo, a corporate logo, and just saying thanks to my Bob's, my Bob's, thanks to Bob's Furniture, that's a big furniture store where I live, thanks to Bob's Furniture, they actually showcased the furniture and told a great story. So not only does Bob's Furniture get the exposure, this turns into a great storytelling opportunity and it's going to get twice the engagement, if not seven times the engagement of posting an ugly corporate logo. If you are just jumping into this and you don't feel confident enough to do video or even take photos yet, try talking to someone on the phone and getting a quote and just doing a pull quote like this. As long as it looks great, it will work on Instagram. Something like this would work really, really well for Twitter or for Facebook or for Pinterest. Okay, the fourth kind of story, community story. So this could be a well-respected community member that continually works with your organization. Like for me, when I worked at um, the domestic violence shelter, I worked at a domestic violence shelter in Virginia as a development and marketing director. And of course, we were constantly challenged to tell impact stories because the women and children we worked with were in crisis and currently living in the shelter. And we le not only ethically, but legally could not tell their stories. So we had a lot of workarounds for great stories. We worked with the police departments. We worked with college campuses. We worked with the Rape Crisis Center. We worked with other organizations in the community and they told stories on our behalf. So these are your community partners, maybe a legislator that you work with, maybe any kind of politician, maybe your local news personality, anyone that has a great story about why they're working with your organization. The speakers that you pull in, at your conferences, at your trainings, at your workshops. These are your community partners. Talk to them, highlight them, find out what makes them tick, find out why they've participated in your organization. Do a storytelling campaign around your community members. So Mira Coalition did an entire storytelling campaign called My Immigrant Mom, and it featured stories from all over Boston, all over Massachusetts, because Mira is in Massachusetts, talking about their immigrant mothers and the stories and just really, really heartwarming. So think about how you can best collect craft, tell some interesting, different stories. So this is great if you are, if you especially if you have challenges getting client stories and showing client faces and, and identifying information. Storytelling pro tip. No one wants to tell you their story, right? So if you say to somebody, tell me your story, that is probably going to fall flat, not because they don't like you, but because no one tends to think they have an interesting enough story to tell. And also, if you told me, I've had this happen to me when I've been interviewed on a podcast, the interviewer would say, so tell me your story. I'm like, I don't, oh, I have a lot of stories. I don't know where you want me to start. Do you want me to start like in first grade? Do you want me to start in college? Do you want me to start in the Peace Corps? What do you want me to do? So you need to give people some prompts to encourage them. 
Um, this is also true for your staff members that you're working with. So once again, when I worked at the domestic violence shelter, I got there within three days, I had emailed the entire staff and said, hey everyone, I need some stories for our newsletter, for our email newsletter. I'd love if you could just email me back. Of course, complete crickets, no one emailed me. Because they didn't know what I meant, they didn't understand, and they thought that I only wanted a client story, or they thought I only wanted a story that was perfectly wrapped in a bow at the end. So asking these leading questions, really thinking like a journalist, asking people, for memories, for experiences, for emotions, for one thing, what is one reason, what is one impact, making it a little bit more tangible helps really, really, really will help you in your work. So I've created a free workbook for you that will walk you through a step-by-step -step process to collect stories, to craft stories, and then to share them on your digital channels. So make sure you check that out. I'm also happy to um, share that link at the end. You'll all get a copy of the slides. All right, so in the last few minutes before we take questions, I did wanna share with you some platforms and tools that you can use. Now, I, don't, I know that one of the questions you might have already typed in is, okay, Julia, this is all great, but just boil it down for me. What social media platforms do I need to be on? So what I would say to that is asking me that is like asking me, just like I said before, where should I live? Where should I buy a house? Well, I don't know. Do you like freezing cold temperatures and winter for seven months of the year? Then yes, you should move with me to Boston. Do you like warm temperatures? Do you like the ocean? Um, you know, what's your budget? Where's your family? I can't answer that question for you, but I can tell you how to answer that question for yourself. So before you decide what social media channels you should jump on and what platforms you should adopt, you need to know, is your audience there? Can you add value? Are you just going to simply send your tweets to Facebook or automate everything? Can you add distinctive value there? And what can you post that's interesting and unique for that channel? Instagram's different than Twitter, okay? Instagram's different than Pinterest. Snapchat is different than LinkedIn. So you have to know the channel, you have to know what kind of content works. But is your audience there? Can you add value? What can you post? You know, do you have the capacity? Can you really design and create content specific to that channel. You know, do you have the capacity to manage another channel? You need to be real with yourself. Like I might wanna live in San Francisco in the full house house, but is that really realistic when my whole family is here? And not only that, I couldn't afford that house. So think about what's realistic for you and your staff and, and your time and your resources. So your new mantra, quality, over quantity, I officially give you permission. You don't have to be on all the channels and do all the things. However, you do have to have a visual with every single story that you tell and everything you post on social media. The good news is you can use your smartphone. You can use native videos. That's a video that you literally record with your smartphone and post on social media. You can do live streaming video um, with your phone. The key is to make your videos just authentic. Be human. You can make really wonderful and expensive and beautifully edited videos. I'm not saying not to do that, but if that is not in your budget, if that's not in your capacity, start out using your smartphone. We have these unbelievably powerful machines in our hands every single day. It could be your video studio, your photo studio. This is a great way to provide, you know, in the moment updates, that behind the scenes stuff we were talking about. It's another great way to genuinely thank supporters. Just go online once a week and make a thank you video for your donors. And I guarantee you will see increased engagement. Center Street Food Pantry, they have a half-time executive director. I help them develop an Instagram strategy. They use Word Swag, which is a mobile app, and they simply share statistics and stories, and they do it three or four times a week, and you just have to get in the habit of doing it, and they've seen their engagement increase exponentially. Cape Ann Animal Aid, really small organization where I live, 
They had people spend the night in their kennels, spend 24 hours in the kennels. They took videos, they shared them on social media. They raised a ton of money for Giving Tuesday. The Diabetes Hands Foundation, I think anyone that has trouble um, or issues, difficulties with client confidentiality, try animation, try avatars. There's creative ways that you can get around sharing physical um, visuals and information. So what are some tools that nonprofits can use? We'll go through this pretty quickly. Canva is my favorite, and that's how I create almost every single one of the graphics that I use. Actually, no, every single one of the graphics. If you use Canva, you're jumping up and down saying, I love Canva. Go to this link or just go to canva.com slash nonprofits. You get a free premium account if you're a 501c3. Animoto is my favorite video editor because it's like video editor for dummies. It's very, very easy to use. You can make a video out of photos. You can do a photo collage. You can make a video out of photo clips and video clips. And it's just very intuitive and very, very easy to use for the accidental techie. And my favorite mobile app is Word Swag, which is um, an app where you can either pull your own photos in and put text overlay, or you can use their stock photos. They have a million fonts and layouts, and you just basically swipe through until you find the one that you like. In terms of scheduling, um, I use Hootsuite and Buffer. I don't schedule out a lot of social media posts, um, and I have found that if you use these third-party tools to schedule to Facebook, they don't get as much engagement. I have not seen that on Twitter, and I actually haven't seen that on LinkedIn. So I use them primarily for LinkedIn, for Twitter. Um, Hootsuite I've occasionally used for clients. Instagram, my Instagram's different. It's very like personal, it's very much me. So I don't schedule out, um, but I, I can see the benefits of it. So I recommend checking out a scheduling tool so you're not spending you know, your whole day on Twitter. If you're looking for content to share that's interesting to your audience, another great tool is BuzzSumo, and they have a nonprofit rate as well. Okay, so let's just boil it down. What are, some, what is, what are the real keys to social media success? Consistency. Social media is like exercise. If you exercise 15 minutes a week, you are not going to get the results that you would if you exercise a few hours a week or even two hours a week. And you have to be focused and strategic. If you just go to the gym and kind of throw some weights around and don't really have a plan, that's not really going to get you anywhere. So as consistent as you can be, you have to show up. You also cannot escape content that people like. You have to spend some time thinking about your audience and giving them the kind of content that they like and that they want to watch, read, and share. Also, I really encourage you, have more confidence. You have something to say. You have something important to share. You have a cause that is resonating with someone, even if it's quote-unquote unsexy. And I hate that term, unsexy cause, because there are no unsexy causes. There are just uncreative people behind those causes. That's what I say. It's sort of like there are no boring people. There are no boring, wait, there's only boring people. I don't know whatever that phrase is. Whenever my daughter says she's bored, I'm always like, there's nothing, there's no boring things. There's only boring people. So have some confidence. Know that what you're doing is important. Know that there is a group of people out there that want to hear what you have to say. Have more confidence. Create that great content. Show up regularly. Be present and you will be successful in your endeavors. Um, so I also have a Facebook group that I monitor for nonprofit social media managers. Just click on that link um, and I can actually put it in the chat if I can find my chat box, but also I will take some questions. I think we're right at the right mark. We're right at 1250. Yeah, we're doing pretty well. Thank you so much, Julia. That was awesome. Sure. Um, thank you. And I, anyone feel free to email me if you have a question that I don't get to, you know, in the Q and A. 
Yes, of course. Um, also, check out Julia's Twitter profile. It's pretty awesome. She's always posting interesting things. Um, it's a plethora oh, of information. So I recommend checking that out as well. Um, just again, to remind everyone, we have a little question and answer box. So um, use this time, get your questions out there. Um, I'm going to get it started because I have questions. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I just want to know, so you, the whole time it was, you know, really stressing that it's about quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. However, you know, I also saying that like, you do need to invest a significant amount of time in your, um, in your social media strategy and your social media in general. Is there a sort of a baseline if you say have one social media profile that you're focusing on a baseline of frequency of posts? Should you be active every day? Should be sending um, a couple of posts a day. Is there any sort of like rule of thumb on that? Sure. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to say, but I think the trend right now for Facebook. So I, I can talk about pretty much each of the channels. What I've been seeing on Facebook is that if you post something that's pretty great, so it's a good photo and it's a quote or it's a good story or it's a short video, even just four or five times a week, um, that can work really well. I don't think I would go less than four times a week because then you run the risk of the algorithm pushing your posts down in the feed. But I, I, on Facebook, quality trumps quantity any day of the week. So if you don't have anything to post today, don't stress out and throw something up because that's going to throw off the algorithm if people are not interacting with it. So you need that visual, you know, a video or a photo. And if you can post four to five times a week on Facebook, that's great. Twitter is a little bit different. So Twitter, of course, I post multiple times a day on Twitter. Um, I actually go in and I interact on Twitter. I spend some time, you know, chatting with people, tagging people, responding to comments. So I use Twitter in a much more interactive way. So it's a little bit more time consuming for me. And I end up sending more tweets. It just depends on your goals and it depends on what you want to use it for. And if your audience is there um, with Instagram, I think you could get away with three times a week. Um, I've even seen people post once a week, as long as it's a great photo, it will, you know, cut through the, cut through the clutter. And also if you haven't posted in a while, Sometimes Instagram likes that. It's, it's just impossible to know the back end secret sauce of like what's going on. The key really is just to pick a place where you can show up consistently and build an audience and it takes time. You know, it's not a silver bullet and you're not going to build that audience on Facebook in a week or even a month. I mean, it's really going to take some time. But once you do and once the algorithm starts seeing that you're posting quality stuff and your audience likes to see it and they're liking it and commenting and sharing or it's creating meaningful conversation. That's huge. Comments are huge. Facebook now takes comments into consideration. Um, so if, as long as, as you are consistently showing up for your audience and providing them with stuff that they want to see, I think, you know, I, I would really focus on one channel showing up consistently like a few times a week. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I always have clients will ask me also in, um, you know, all about the algorithms. And, and the truth is, is like, you know, we know some things we don't know others, you know what I mean? Like sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it's sort of interesting that way. But once you're right, once you start being consistent about it, really like all those questions kind of go away. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I can tell you is sharing links that go to outside websites I would not do that more than once a week because now the trend is Facebook doesn't like that. They don't want you to go outside their site. So keeping people within the site as much as possible. And that's why Facebook fundraisers are so popular because Facebook loves them because they're not, you're not sending someone to an outside donation page. You can stay within Facebook's ecosystem. So yeah. as much, and don't post YouTube links to Facebook because Facebook hates that because they hate YouTube. So try to like, you've got to think about these companies as businesses and they don't play nicely with each other and they don't want to like Twitter does not want to send you to Instagram. That's why when you auto post from Instagram to Twitter, it doesn't pull up the photo. It just has a link, which doesn't work at all. So think about these companies as businesses that compete with each other and use them individually, you know, really create content that's unique to each channel. 
Okay. All right. Really, really great advice. Um, I want to encourage everyone again. We have a couple of minutes left, so get your questions in now. Um, I do have another one as well, though. Um, I have a lot of times clients asking me if hiring a designated social media person is, um, is worth it or how they can make that sell to their higher ups. Um, is there, again, sort of, does it just depend on the size of your organization or is it a good idea to invest in a social media person nowadays for a nonprofit? I think you, you really need to look at your goals for the year. So if you are, you know, if, if online fundraising is going to be one of your goals or if thought leadership is a goal, maybe getting more press coverage is a goal. Maybe your executive director wants to publish a book. So it depends on your goals. But if you're, if any of your goals require you to get like a critical mass of audience members, then definitely I would invest in at least a part-time person that can actively grow that audience. But mm -hmm. if you are bootstrapping, if you guys are like grant to grant, you know, paycheck to paycheck, um, struggling to even make salaries, and you need to really focus on bringing more, bringing more income in and probably in more traditional ways. Um, so for an organization that's pretty stable, that has a lot of great content to share, that has a lot of stories to get out there, that really wants to reach new audiences, reach younger audiences, I do think it's it's good to invest in at least, you know, a, or at least task social media to a person that's a staff member, but that does mean you have to take something off that person's desk. So what you don't want to do is just say, oh, this webinar is awesome. Great. Here's the slides. Here's the social media stuff. And then give it to somebody that already has a full-time job, which I know everyone's laughing because I know that's exactly what's happened to them. Because <laughs> those are those are my clients. They're the accidental social media managers that signed up to be a development director and then somehow social media got thrown on them. So it, I think the key is to go to the higher ups and say, look, if this is what you want to accomplish, you know, if you want to double website traffic and you want to get all these online donors and you really want to do Facebook fundraising and you want to do this, this is the amount of time that it's taking me off of my job. And if we still want to stay on this track and really get results, then we are going to have to either take something else off my plate or hire someone to do this. So the real key is just not to lump it on to somebody else's job description, which I know gets done 99.9% .9 of the time. Oh, so yeah. I really, I mean, I, I would focus on financial stability first. And then, you know, all of you on the webinar, you need to advocate for yourself. And I know it's hard, trust me, but you do need to say, this is work. This is hard work. This is not, you know, just simply posting about what I had for lunch today. And I think there's still a lot of misconception around digital marketing as an actual career and as something that can get viable results for organizations, but um, I do think if your organization can invest in it, it's it's definitely worth it to have a dedicated person. It's just not realistic for a lot of organizations. Hundred percent, and I think we'll end on that note. Just mm -hmm. you know, it is important, and I think that I've taken that away from this webinar. I'm really excited to share what I've learned with our clients. Um, again, everyone who's on here, um, I will be sending out um, the slides, so don't worry if you miss something. And Julia, thank you so much. That was awesome. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Emma. Oh, of course. We always love having you guys. So everyone stay tuned. We'll have another webinar coming out in December. So check your emails for it. And thank you again, Julia. Bye. Take care. Bye.